Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome co-founder Strive Asset Management, Vivek Bremaswamy. Thank you guys, thank you for the warm welcome. I've been walking the halls, feel like a lot of you know me this year, and then every fifth person comes up and says, are you Cash Patel? And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> I'm still, they still don't know me. <laughs> so it's good to be back. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story from a, from a few years ago, when I had to make a choice. Okay, this is gonna be a speech about choice, by the way. I had to make a choice in 2020. This is back when I was a biotech CEO, it was a multi-billion dollar company. I'd found it, I'd built it from scratch. But in 2020, after George Floyd died, I was expected to make a statement in favor of the Black Lives Matter movement. It was a choice. I chose not to do it. I said that our purpose as a company is to make medicines, to make products and services for people who need them. But that was the beginning of a six month journey that culminated about six months later and three prominent advisors to my company resigning. And I had to make a choice. Was I going to speak through the filter of corporate self-interest, or was I going to speak freely as a citizen? And from that moment forward, I chose to speak freely as a citizen. Thank you. I wrote Woke Inc., I wrote Nation of Victims, I traveled the country calling out the woke industrial complex in America. I started a new company called Strive to take on BlackRock and the ESG movement through the market itself, saying that it's not their job to tell us to use our dollars in how we live our lives. I called out the three secular religions in America that have America in a chokehold today. The first of them is this woke racial religion that says your identity is based on your skin color. That if you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged. That if you're white, you're inherently privileged, no matter your economic background or your upbringing. That your race determines who you are and what you can achieve in life. It's one that Congresswoman Ayanna Presley of the squad summed up really well when she said, we don't want any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice. I do not fit her description of what counts as a brown voice, I assure you that. But it is a really clever move in this religion, which is this. If you, your race goes from being about your skin color to being about the content of the ideas you're allowed to espouse, then any disagreement with those ideas automatically makes you a racist. And there is no greater damnation in modern America than to be called a racist. So when given the choice between pledging allegiance to this new religion and being tarred with the scarlet R, that's when everyday Americans started to bend the knee. And that's what created this new culture of fear in America, when it then combined with the second religion. That's a new secular religion in America that says, the sex of the person you're attracted to has to be hardwired on the day you were born. It had to be or else it couldn't be a civil right. But your own biological sex is completely fluid over the course of your lifetime. It makes no sense unless it's a religion. It doesn't match up to reason, it matches up to religion. And then it makes the same move as the first religion. Well, you know what, Peter Thiel, who's a man who's attracted to men, the Advocate Magazine, one of the leading LGBTQIA plus magazines, said that Peter Thiel is not gay after he spoke at the RNC because he did not represent the gay voice. So now you're starting to see a pattern. Which then brings us to the doorstep of the third religion that has America in a chokehold, and that is the newest one that looks like it's here to stay until we do something about it, and we will. That is the climate religion in America that says that we have to fight carbon emissions at all costs in the United States while we shift those same carbon emissions to places like China that supposedly, even if you believe in this religion, you would have embraced nuclear energy, which is the best form of carbon-free energy production known to mankind. And yet these people oppose nuclear energy. What's really going on is that the climate religion has about as much to do with the climate as the Spanish Inquisition had to do with Christ, which is to say nothing at all. It is about power, dominion, control, punishment, and apologizing for what we have achieved in this country and the modern West as we know it. 
So the real question is, what's going on? What the heck is going on in our country where these same religions, not, not religions of Christ, different religions arise at the same time? What's really going on here? And the answer is that we are in the middle of a national identity crisis in America. Okay, we are so hungry. Take it from me. I'm 37 years old. I'm a millennial. I was born in 1985. I will tell you this. My generation, really every generation of Americans today, we're so hungry for a cause. We're hungry for purpose and meaning and identity at a point in our national history when the things that used to fill our hunger for purpose, faith, patriotism, hard work, family, these things have disappeared. We're hungry to be part of something bigger than ourselves, yet we cannot even answer the question of what it means to be an American today. This is an opportunity for the GOP. This is an opportunity for the conservative movement to rise to the occasion and fill that void with a vision of American national identity that runs so deep that it dilutes this woke poison to irrelevance. I am all in on the America First agenda. Believe me, I'm an America First conservative. I will not apologize for it. But to put America first, we now need to rediscover what America is. And that is why last week I announced my run for U.S. president to deliver a national identity that we are missing in this country. So what does it mean to be an American? It means you believe in merit, that you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. And that is why, as U.S. President, I have pledged to get rid of affirmative action in this country once and for all. It is a national cancer on our soul, and we are done with it. It came into existence by an executive order from Lyndon Johnson. Every president since Lyndon Johnson could have crossed it out. I love the man. I'm going to come and talk to him about it in a second. But I'm going to tell you, cross that out. We're done with affirmative action in America. Okay? That's the first thing. But back to the question, what does it mean to be American? Okay? This is, this is the question. It means we believe that the people who we elect to run the government, whoever it is, ought to be the people who actually run the government. Radical idea in America. Who would have ever thought? It's not the case today. So the next time we have an Anthony Fauci or a Merrick Garland or a James Comey who goes far beyond their constitutional scope, you need to do what a chief executive in this country is constitutionally empowered to do. You fire them, you fire their employees, you fire the managerial industrial complex around them. And I'll tell you this even further. Thank you very much. We got to go one step further than that. Because when a managerial cancer gets so bad in this country, you can't just reform that from on high. I come from the private sector. I know this. If you tell me that somebody works for me and I can't fire them, that means that they don't work for me. It means I work for them. It means I am their slave because... I am responsible for what they do without having any power to determine it. Well, that can't be the position that the U.S. president is put in. When a managerial cancer gets so bad, you have one option left in this country. You have to shut it down. And I've already said last week, the first agency we will shut down and need to shut down in the United States is the U.S. Department of Education. It has no reason to exist. Never should have existed. Make a mistake, it's better late than never, you shut it down. And today I'm ready to announce the second government agency that I will shut down in this country. We should have done it 60 years ago. It's hurt Republicans and Democrats alike. We're going to get it done. It's finally time to shut down the FBI in America. <laughs> Create something new to take its place because we are done with the J. Edgar Hoover legacy to let this be a self-governing nation again. What does it mean to be American? It means you believe in the rule of law. Okay, the people who enter this country better darn well come through the front door because your first act of entering this country cannot be a law-breaking one. And I'll tell you this, as a kid of immigrants, that is not racist. That is what it means to be American. Okay, it means that you believe the military in this country 
protects our border rather than somebody else's border halfway around the world. It means you put American interests first. You know, talk about a legitimate use of the U.S. military. You want to call the Mexican cartels a drug terrorist organization? Treat them like a terrorist organization. We can do it to bin Laden. We can do it to Soleimani. We can do it to the Mexican drug cartels south of the border. That is how we end the fentanyl epidemic in this country. If the military does one thing, it protects the soil we live on, not somebody else's soil. That, too, is what it means to be American. Well, what it means to be American, it means you believe in the Declaration of Independence. It means you believe in 1776. The Declaration of Independence of today is our Declaration of Independence from China. If Thomas Jefferson were alive today, that is the Declaration of Independence he would sign. That is the Declaration of Independence I will sign if I'm elected as your next president. Because you know what? We are in trouble when we have a codependent relationship with our enemy. The Soviet Union, they never put the shoes on our feet. They never put the phones in our pocket. We're in a codependent relationship with our enemy, and codependent relationships do not end well. The only question is who ends it first. The sooner we end it, the better for us. The later we end it, the better for them. And I think it is finally to say we are done with relying on an enemy to power our modern way of life. Some of this is going to be easy. It's the easy stuff. Abandon climate religion, the climate religion that shackles the United States while leaving China untouched. I don't know why more Republicans can't just say that aloud. It's the thing you're not supposed to say. It's a sacred cow. You take that sacred cow to the slaughterhouse where it belongs. Climate religion is about actually shackling America itself. Some of this stuff is easy. They send the fentanyl across our southern border. They send the digital fentanyl through TikTok, financial fentanyl in the form of the national debt that's created this addictive relationship to China. We declare independence. We're done with financial fentanyl, digital fentanyl, actual fentanyl. Some of this stuff we can agree on. Now, I appreciate the applause, but I also want to be really honest with you. My number one opposition, I've been, I'm nine days into this presidential campaign, and the number one opposition I get to what I just told you actually comes from the Republican Party, a wing of the Republican Party that is so addicted to buying cheap stuff from China and expanding into the Chinese market that they're not ready to make that short-run sacrifice. I go further. I, I think it's important to be honest. If we want to declare independence from China, that means we got to be willing to ban most U.S. businesses from doing business in China until the CCP falls or until the CCP radically reforms itself. Because there is no easy way out other than taking that Band-Aid and ripping it right off. I'm sorry, Henry Kissinger. We're done with your experiment in America. It is the only way out. We got to start thinking on the time scales of history, not the time scales of electoral cycles. We don't need Chamberlain. We need a little bit of Churchill in this country. And you know what? Yes. If you're willing to make a sacrifice, the chances are you'll never have to make it because the other side will fall first. And you can be willing to make a sacrifice if you know what you are sacrificing for. And that is this thing we call America. Our inner animal spirit, it has been domesticated. It has been tamed by this new culture that embraces victimhood and rejects excellence. Our inner animal, it has leapt oceans to lift up places like China on the other side of the world while their culture of Maoist victimhood came back to hold us down. I'll tell you this, when we rallied behind the cry to make America great again, we did not just hunger for a single man. We hungered for the unapologetic pursuit of excellence. That is what it means to be an American. Thank you. Now, I'm going to do something tonight. I want to address the, I love the boisterous sides. I want to address it actually directly. I believe in free speech. Free speech is what it means to be American. So even if you disagree with us saying, stand up and say it because you deserve to. This is the country we live in for a reason. Let me address it right away. Okay, you're going to hear tomorrow night from my good friend, Donald Trump, a man who I took inspiration from 
to do what I am doing now. If he hadn't done what he did in 2015 and 2016 as an outsider to came and shake up the system, I wouldn't have even thought about doing what I'm doing today and running for president. That's just a fact, okay? Now, next six months, <laughs> it's possible as this goes, you know, we'll get a little bit of name calling and you know what? <laughs> That's part of, uh, what do you say, locker room talk, a little bit of trash talk on the court. You got to have some fun and handle it. But I think if you can't handle a little bit of name calling in this or have some fun, you probably shouldn't be the person sitting across the table representing this country in front of Xi Jinping either. But I will tell you something about my friend. He is misunderstood across this country. I know him. He cares deeply about national unity. I know you care deeply about national unity. I'm running for president because I care deeply about national unity. But here's the question. This is the question for the next year and a half in the conservative movement, in the Republican Party, and in America. Do we want a national divorce or do we want a national revival? It's not going to happen automatically. Whatever it is, it is going to be what we choose it to be. That is the question today. And I'll tell you, here's how we're not going to get national unity. We're not going to get national unity with somebody showing up in the proverbial middle saying, hey, can't we all hold hands, compromise, get along, kumbaya? No, that ain't happening. That ship has sailed long ago. You want national unity? Here's how you get national unity. You get national unity in this country by embracing the extremism the radicalism of the ideals that set this nation into motion 250 years ago. Merit, free speech, open debate, self-governance over aristocracy. These are radical ideas. Most of human history, it was done the other way. Old world Europe didn't do it this way. We did it this way for a reason, because we're different. We're Americans, and if we embrace that, that is our formula to actually deliver, I think, the most unifying thing we could deliver for the country in 2024, and it's this. Don't believe it when they tell you it's about Republicans and Democrats. Artificial distinctions. What really matters in this country is a battle between the managerial class and the everyday citizen, between the Great Reset and the Great Uprising, between the pro-American movement, do you believe in this country and are you willing to stand for it, or the anti-American movement which apologizes what this country stands for. And here's the good news I have for you. When you divide it up that way, instead of Republicans and Democrats, you got an 80-20 in our favor. And you know what's happened in 2024? You mark my words, I predict a 1980-style, 1984-style landslide election in this country if we get it right. That is the single most unifying thing we could deliver for our nation going forward. I'll tell you this, for the last 10, 20 years in America, we have celebrated our diversity and our differences so much that we forgot all the ways we're the same. Well, you know what? Revive the ways that we are the same. Diversity is not our strength. Our strength is what unifies us across our diversity. And you mark my words, that won the American Revolution. It reunited us after the Civil War. It won us two world wars and the Cold War. It could still be hope for the free world. And if we can revive that over fractious group identity, then nobody in the world is going to defeat us. That is American exceptionalism. Thank you very much. God bless you. God bless our great country. All the best. Thank you. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.